What if anybody on earth could trade with anybody else on earth whatever they want, whenever they want, and without permission from anybody else? What would that world look like? What would the political and economic implications be? That technology is currently being produced, and it's the subject of this episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Welcome to the 62nd episode of Patterson in Pursuit. It's going to be a total change of pace today. We're not talking about philosophy. We're talking about technology and a very particular kind of technology that I'm really interested in. I know a lot of you guys are interested in, and it's in the news headlines all the time right now. That is blockchain technology. Now, it just so happens that blockchain technology has really big economic and political implications, which is the reason I got originally interested in it. And in fact, my first book is not Square One, The Foundations of Knowledge. It is an introductory book about Bitcoin. It's called What's the Big Deal About Bitcoin? Now, as excited as I am about Bitcoin, there's another technology I am even more excited about. I think it has even bigger implications on politics and economics, and it just so happens that my very own brother has founded a company that's working on this piece of technology called Open Bazaar. We'll get into that in the interview. So if you're looking for a conversation about epistemology or logic this week, you aren't going to find it in this episode. But if you're looking for a discussion about the basics of Bitcoin technology, we'll talk a little bit about Ethereum and this project Open Bazaar and what the implications might be for using new technology to decentralize political power, then that's the subject for this episode. Before we jump into it, I want to tell you guys some good news. Usually I don't plug upcoming episodes that much, but I just got to say, I have got a set of upcoming interviews you guys are going to flip for. In fact, just earlier this week, I recorded my very favorite conversation of all time, which should be up either next week or the week after that. It's about scientific bullshit, and it is 10 out of 10 fantastic. Make sure you guys tune in for that one. I also want to tell you about the sponsor of this show. I just had a conversation with my friend last night who works with the company Praxis, and he said, Steve, I wanted to let you know that I'm working with a young man who heard about Praxis through your show. He applied and got accepted. Now he's going through some of the Praxis training, and my guess is that he's setting himself up for both immediate and future career success. Whenever I hear things like that, it really affects me because I am a huge supporter of this company. I'm not just blowing smoke at you guys. If you're somebody that feels like your soul was crushed at university, or you avoided university or want to avoid university, or let's say you graduated, or let's say you're in your mid-20s, you didn't go to college, but you know that you can do anything that you put your mind to, check out the company Praxis. They are built to give people like you practical job training that is followed immediately by six months of a paid apprenticeship in the real world. To learn more about the program, go to steve-patterson.com slash praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S. All right, so I hope you find this interview interesting with my very own brother, Sam Patterson. He's the author of Bitcoin Beginner and the co-founder of OB1, which is the company developing the Open Bazaar protocol. The links to both of our books about Bitcoin will be in the show notes page this week, steve-patterson.com slash 62. Brother Sam Patterson, it is a delight to have you on my podcast. One of the areas that I've been interested in for years, and I know you have been because we talk about it all the time, is the tech crypto world and its relation to politics and economics. Where I want to start is kind of the circumstance we find ourselves in. I'd say right now we are in a crypto boom. There's all kinds of different cryptocurrencies and crypto projects that are going on. If people aren't familiar with what crypto is... um, Right now, you probably heard a technology called Bitcoin. Most people at least heard of it. But there's these other technologies called Ethereum, Litecoin, uh, Zerocoin, uh, or Zcash, as I think it's called now, Monero. There's a bunch of different cryptocurrencies out there. And 
within the past, I don't know, at least the past month, um, we've hit, I believe there's more than $100 billion that's been invested in these um, cryptocurrencies. The prices have gone through the roof. Some of them have gone up, you know, a thousand percent or more. But as the interest grows, I think ignorance grows as well, because there's a lot of people that hear about the technology, the technologies, they get excited, but they don't really know what's going on. They don't really know what it's about. So before we talk about the project you're invested or you're, um, you're working on and you've co-founded, I want to talk just a little bit about crypto technology. So when people are talking about Bitcoin, people are talking about technology, Open Bazaar, they're talking about blockchain technology. What is blockchain technology in the first place? Sure. So to back up even further, <clears throat> um, we say the term crypto a lot, which is short for cryptography. Uh, which is basically a, a, a field of mathematics that determines how to apply math to making um, more secure messaging and uh, more security in general of data. Okay, so cryptocurrency in the world of crypto, as we call it now, is a, 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 a sub branch of uh, cryptography where people figured out how to use math in a way to create more or less digital currency, digital cash. Uh, and that, which happened in late uh, in uh, early 2009 with Bitcoin was the first time, um, has sort of boomed over the past, uh, you know, eight years or so into the space that you were just talking about. So blockchain was the first real advance in cryptography in this in this field um that allowed for for cryptocurrency and so that's that's a good place to start so <clears throat> the problem with doing digital money before the blockchain technology was invented was a problem called the double spending problem right so if you have uh, a piece of physical you know gold coin or or a, a federal reserve note a dollar um and i give it to you Right, that cannot exist in two places at once. Right, right. physically, the, uh, the laws of reality don't allow that to happen. Assuming we're not going quantum, but okay. <laughs> assuming, yeah, no, the Copenhagen, Copenhagen interpretation is false, <laughs> as I know from listening to your show. So. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, so <clears throat> that that means that cash works uh, in the real world uh, because either you have it or you don't. There's no ambiguity. The problem in the digital world is. If something's digital, I can have it on my computer and you can have it on your computer at the same time. So if with cash, uh, what if what if I give you a digital coin and give someone else the same digital coin right. and neither of you knows, right? That's a problem. Okay. So, so blockchain uh, uh, was a development that allowed for people to be certain that the digital cash or the digital representation of value they had only they had a claim to it. Mm -hmm. No one else could have a claim to it. Uh, that is sort of what, what Bitcoin solved. And the way that it does it is it creates uh, a distributed ledger of the transaction. So uh, things like PayPal, you can say, oh, well, that's a digital currency, and they solved the problem. Well, what they did is they just have a big database themselves, and they are the ones that are settling that database. They are the ones taking... $10 out of my account and putting $10 into your account mm -hmm. and making sure that it zeroes out in the end. Now that requires you to trust PayPal. That requires you to trust, uh, you know, banks do this as well. It requires you to trust a third party, trust a financial institution. Well, Bitcoin actually allows you to transfer this value and be certain that no one else has the value and not trust any third party mm. because of this distributed ledger. Uh, so the transactions will will uh, basically be uh, viewable by everyone uh, and the network that's running the particular code that Bitcoin's based on. And then everyone can verify that that's accurate, that you can look back through your history of transactions and say, yes, this particular uh, piece of Bitcoin, so to, so to speak, this, this uh, digital representation of value uh, the history is legitimate, and I know that no one else owns it but me. Mm. And and so this history of transactions, uh, these are all collected in blocks, and it is literally just a chain of blocks that extends all the way back to the beginning of Bitcoin's introduction in mm. January 2009. 
So that's the term that people like to throw around, the blockchain, blockchain. That's really yeah. all it is. It's a, a, a ledger system that is maintained by a network of computers instead of one central agency. Now, the question or questions are, why are there so many different blockchains? So we have the Bitcoin blockchain, but we also have the Litecoin blockchain. And who knows, right. maybe 1,000, 15, 2,000, I don't know what the number is up to, probably more than that at this point, different cryptocurrency chains. So one of the objections that's very common in the Bitcoin space, is they go, oh, Bitcoin is something that can't can have value because look, there all, there's all these other coins They're on the other chains because you have these, this type of competition. That means Bitcoin, the value that um, it's creating can just be replicated so therefore it's probably right. you know right now it's in a bubble something like that well the first objection there is just uh, a fundamental economic one which is that all value is subjective so if if i say that i want to have uh you know this digital representation of value in, on a particular blockchain and i'm willing to pay x amount of you know fiat or provide a service or a good for it um, then it does have that value, at least to the people engaged in the trade. So, mm -hmm. so at some point, you can't say it doesn't have value because value <laughs> right. is subjective. So it does, right? Right. Um, and, I, and I know there are some people who believe in intrinsic value and all that, but that's another discussion. But, uh, but your question is basically, yeah, if you can have infinite blockchains and competing blockchains, how can any one like Bitcoin have like more value than another? Right. Well. Uh, the first is there's network effects, right? And a network effect means means that the larger the network is, the more value it provides to the people in the network. Uh, so Bitcoin has the largest network effect of any cryptocurrency because it was the first. Uh, it has the most people using it. It has the most people who sort of believe in it. Uh, therefore, it's the most valuable. Now, other blockchains have existed for a while. Effectively, what most of them are are uh, they're all they're often called altcoins they basically took bitcoin's code which is all open source everyone can see it they change a couple parameters here and there uh they change maybe how quickly blocks are are mined uh they, there's all kinds of things they can change and then they release it with a new name mm. um so the, the question is uh why do those have value well it might be that the changes that were made were changes that actually make it more useful for any particular use case. Um, so there's one called Litecoin, um, which has some different parameters than Bitcoin. Some people might think that Litecoin is better than Bitcoin for a certain use case, and therefore they, they provide value, they, they mm. purchase it. Um, there are other cryptocurrencies um, or, or even crypto platforms um, that are different enough from Bitcoin that people say they provide a substantial uh, a difference or benefit over Bitcoin. So one, the obvious one is Ethereum. Mm -hmm. uh, Ethereum is meant to be similar to Bitcoin in that it's a blockchain, except the, 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 the scripting system, the scripting language that you can use in order to run uh, uh, programs on this sort of distributed ledger is uh, Turing complete, which basically means it should be able to more or less run any any program you ask it to do, which cannot be done on Bitcoin. It's much more tight scripting language. Mm. So uh, what it basically means is you have this sort of decentralized computing system that you can pay uh, um, money into and have these nodes all over the world running your computer program. Right. Uh, now, Ethereum uh, has recently become much more valuable. Just over the past six months, it's increased, I don't know, several, I don't know, a thousand times in value or something insane. Um, you know, is that value? Is that value because the actual utility is there, or is the value from speculation? So that's another part mm. of this of this um, crypto boom, is that many people are getting into it because they saw the gains that Bitcoin had, right. uh, which were pretty rapid and and significant. Um, you know, Bitcoin started in two thousand nine with really effectively no monetary worth. Uh, in two thousand ten, I think. Um, you know, someone sold a pizza for 10,000 Bitcoin. Uh, that came, kind of gave it its first little bit of value. Uh, and then it's, it's increased. It's sort of a stable for another couple of years. And then it went up to, you know, eventually it made uh, parity with the dollar. And then uh, in 2013, 
it got up to about ten, fifteen dollars, and then at the beginning of the year, and then at the end of the year, it was like over a thousand. So twenty thirteen, right. it went nuts, and it's been up and down since then. Now it's up to uh, like twenty five hundred. It's gone up again. But what we're seeing is a lot of people want those immediate gains. They want the get right. rich quick, and so they invest and speculate on all these coins. Uh, I think Ethereum especially has has sort of seen that recently. And I I think that long term, uh, there's there, there has been a divergence from the utility that the coins actually provide in the real world and the price that they've achieved because people are speculating. So long term, that will return. But for now, it's it's a bubble, I think. Yes. And I, I one note on Ethereum in particular, because that's the kind of the arguably the main people view it as a competitor um, to Bitcoin or alternative to Bitcoin is in the the world of cryptocurrency and crypto in general, the main value proposition of Bitcoin from my perspective is that it's intended to be a currency in the sense that it's supposed to be a monetary unit, it's supposed to be cash, digital cash. This is not the, the purpose of Ethereum. Though they're both technically cryptocurrencies, if you want to call them that, the one is like a money protocol, and then Ethereum is completely different. It's uh, it is a it's a brilliant, interesting system, but the those units are designed to pay computers to run programs on a decentralized right. network. So it's totally apples and oranges, and I think there's a lot of people that are just kind of throwing money <laughs> at. Let's say Ethereum, because I think, oh, it's just the same thing. It's Bitcoin, two, you know, two point oh, but really they're just to two totally different systems. Yeah, I mean, Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator of Bitcoin, wrote in his original white paper. Uh, the title of it is "Bitcoin: A Peer-to-Peer -peer Electronic Cash System." Right, and that is what it was meant to be. Uh, now, another topic of discussion is the fact that Bitcoin has sort of changed in recent years from being a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system and being more like an electronic store value, mm. uh, which is a whole other discussion. But Ethereum was never meant to be either of those things, a store right. value or a currency. Uh, as you said, it's meant to be a way to pay for a decentralized uh, computing system. And I think, I mean, if something has underlying utility and then people decide to take a thing that has underlying utility and start using it as currency, that's mm -hmm. totally possible. I yeah. mean, that's, that's what happens with even like gold and stuff, right? Um, but if, if making it a store value and a currency undermines the original utility, which I think is what's happening in Ethereum right now, uh, long term, I think that that divergence will, will come back together. Right. And yeah. Well, yeah. this is a perfect segue because so the original reason I got interested in Bitcoin, I think the reason you got interested in Bitcoin, is a mixture of the economic and the political. Um, I was interested in Bitcoin, I probably heard about it maybe in 2010, it was I think worth around a dollar. No, I didn't, I didn't get invested because I thought there's no way this is going to work as right. was virtually everybody's experience around that time. I thought, no, nah, this isn't going to work. And I kind of forgot about it and then was aware it went up to $10. And I was like, gee, this is a bubble. This is crazy. Yeah, I still didn't, I still didn't buy it then, long story. Anyway, what I found really enticing about Bitcoin was the idea of having a currency unit that was both scarce and easily transmissible over the internet. So to, it's, not, it's, a, it's an amazing technological computer problem that uh, the creator of Bitcoin solved, but it's also an amazing political and economic one because currencies historically have been created by central decree, by the king, by the government, by a central bank. And inevitably, that always results in the value of the currency being diminished. It always results in inflation or rampant inflation. So this was really exciting, the idea that, well, this is a currency that actually can't be inflated. Now, what I want to talk about with you is another technology that incorporates blockchain technology and has economic and political implications in a, in a different way, arguably maybe even a more fundamental way. So what is the project 
that you are working on, the, the company that you've co-founded, the technology that you're working on. And then I want to talk about the economics and politics of this technology. Sure. So the, the project that I work on is called Open Bazaar. And Open Bazaar is a decentralized marketplace online. And in order to explain what that means, I have to sort of back up and set the stage uh, for how e-commerce um, <clears throat> has worked in the past. Uh, and by the way, to answer your other questions uh, briefly before I get into that, I co-founded a company called OB1. The goal of OB1 is to build Open Bazaar, this marketplace, and then provide services to users on Open Bazaar. Hmm. That's how OB1 makes its money. Uh, so, online commerce since the internet has sort of gone public uh, in the early to mid 90s has been completely dominated by centralized institutions. Uh, so, you know, if, if most of you know your listeners are American, they're familiar with Amazon, or really all over the world now, not just American, but uh, Amazon. Um, there's um, Alibaba in China and um, a bunch of other similar uh, institutions like Etsy and eBay and Craigslist. And basically what that model is, is you have a company that has a server infrastructure. So they have a bunch of computers sitting somewhere and they provide the service to the public of matching a buyer and a seller together on their website. They then take a cut of that transaction, which is typically between 10 and 20%. Uh, they monitor the, the data of everyone that buys and sells on their platforms. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, from a, a, a political and, and economic perspective, is they censor the trade that's happening as well. Um, they do that for their own benefit monetarily. Uh, so some examples of that would be like Amazon not allowing the Google Chromecast media streaming device to be sold on their platform because mm. they sell the competing media streaming device, the Fire Stick, right? So they just censor their competitors' goods mm. uh, for their own benefit. But but more importantly, they'll censor trade on behalf of governments uh, in order to uh, obey the laws of their relevant jurisdictions. Um, and I mean, we can go into the, the the potential drawbacks of that sort of censorship, but. Uh, you know, some examples are are pretty obvious where you have platforms like in China not allowing certain books to be sold to the people, right? Mm, right. Because the government yeah. doesn't allow it. So um, so what we do, what Open Bazaar does is it, it turns it on its head, right? Instead of having this central meeting place for buyers and sellers that is controlled by a particular organization that is heavily influenced by the government, we actually take the middleman out entirely. And we, we've we created a software program where uh, someone downloads this free open source program to their computer, and then they connect directly to someone else who has done the same thing, and they engage in trade with each other without a middleman, right? Mm -hmm. So if you remove the middleman, that means that there's no cut being taken, that 10 or 20% uh, you know, is, is kept uh, between the buyer and the seller. Uh, there's no data being collected, so there's no central institution that is now aware of both parties and the goods involved or, ex or services exchanged. Uh, and there's no censorship. So there's no one in the middle that can say, yes, you have permission uh, to do this trade or no, you don't have permission to do this trade. Mm. So the, the idea is sort of that we're replicating in-person trade, right? Like I can come up to you and buy or sell something uh, with cash without anyone interfering and doing that online. Mm. You know, it's permissionless trade. And the reason that uh, this sort of is, is happening you know, now instead of 10 years ago is that Bitcoin finally exists. We finally mm. have this permissionless cash. We have uh, a digital currency that doesn't have any middlemen as well. So you wouldn't really be able to do this without something like Bitcoin because you're going to always have someone, a middleman in that payment layer who can censor those transactions or right. take a cut there or, or mine the data there. Now you allow this um, you know, lack of middlemen, this permissionless trade to occur anywhere in the world. And uh, we're really excited about it because we view it as lowering the barriers to entry for trade down to the absolute 
lowest possible, which is there's no cost to using the software. There's no cost to list fees. There's no cut being taken. Uh, all you need is a computer and the internet, and you can trade anything with anyone in the world at no cost. It's incredible. And so as somebody that is that in fact got in interested in philosophy through economics and politics that was kind of the way i wound up in philosophy i still say that if you want to understand how the world works in practice you have to understand economics you have to understand how commerce works commerce is the lifeblood of uh human existence it's the reason that we're all not uh, all living nasty brutish and short lives so the idea that there, is, there could be a technology out there which is allows, as you say, individuals with an internet connection anywhere in the world to trade and engage in mutually beneficial exchange with anybody else in the world without a middleman, without censorship. Five years ago, it would be like a pipe dream. Like That sounds like yeah. a completely world-changing technology to me. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the hope. That's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's, that's certainly the vision of open bazaar which is that uh, um i mean the, the slogan is sort of uh let's make trade free and, and that's a double meaning right like literally uh no cost to do trade but also free trade in general like we we support people uh, being empowered to trade with each other uh, however they see fit um and it's it's a big it's a big dream but um right now the only alternatives are to use these centralized institutions. Um, and we thought putting out a free open source alternative and protocol was really the way to allow people to, to, to do it themselves. Uh, and this, this sort of fits into a broader, <clears throat> this fits into a, a broader narrative about gatekeepers throughout history. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, we've seen it, for you know millennia or, or centuries uh when you have a small group of folks that give approval or access to others to do certain things they they abuse that power mm -hmm. um so you know before uh the printing press opened up access to information across uh, the world you had, you know, literally uh, scribes and, and people in monasteries who were able to, you know, continue the, the written word. And, and most people were illiterate and the cost of books was incredibly high. And, you know, unless you were really rich, you didn't have access to outside knowledge. Um, and, and the same was true even in the last century with, with uh, mass media. You know, you had maybe, maybe a half dozen radio uh, channels in any given market, you know, maybe that number of TV stations, uh, they all told you more or less the same news. <laughs> uh, it was all very tightly centrally controlled. And when the internet came in, it busted all of that up 100%. The, the cost for people to, uh, to trade, so to speak, to, to transmit information to each other came down extremely low. Um, almost zero in, in, in many cases. Um, and yeah, certainly there's problems with that in some aspect, the signal to noise ratio and that kind of thing. But uh, the benefits have massively outweighed the cost in my mind. And that finally happened with money, with Bitcoin, but it didn't happen with trade up until very recently. And I think that's been you know, a huge detriment. So now hopefully we're reversing that. Well, the thing that I... Lo shy away from talking about when we're talking about politics let's say political theory is power this concept of power the reason i shy away from it is because when i was an undergrad um the people that would talk about power and power structures were let's say collectivists in the in the formal sense that they um would have been traditionally maybe on the left and they didn't they didn't like capitalism they didn't like the power structures of capitalism and you hear power structures come up comes up in the work of michel foucault who's often invoked by people with i think um incorrect political beliefs but just in the past few years maybe the past year i've kind of rediscovered the explanatory power let's say of this concept of political power and when you think about 
how the power dynamic changes with the internet, with the printing press is a good example, with the internet, with Bitcoin, and now with OpenBazaar, I think it's trending in the right direction, where my political bias is towards individual power. I want individuals to be empowered to make the decisions in their own lives that they want to make. I want them to be able to choose their own values, their own goals, be able to freely act in order to achieve those goals. And I don't like the idea of centralized power, be it in the government or in organized religion or even in some um, large companies. I think especially when there's connection with government, I think you have an abuse of centralized power. But when technology has reached the point where individuals can now choose what information they're consuming online, it's not the six channels on the television that's all telling you the same thing. It's now an, a limitless practically amount of information from all over the world uh, on the internet. And when individuals can choose to get paid in a currency that literally can't be centrally regulated or in inflated, and when individuals literally have the power to engage in trade that they otherwise couldn't engage in, I think that is a radical but beneficial progression. This is why I got excited about Bitcoin. This is also why I'm really excited about Open Bazaar because it brings power back to the individuals. Is that your position? Is that the way that you're that you and maybe Ob1 and you guys are approaching this? Are you viewing this as as uh, as a really cool tech, you know, that has a that has a really cool economic niche to fill? Or are you guys like, hey, we see the bigger picture, we see how technology is being used to empower individuals, and we want to be part, we want to contribute to that motion? Right. I cannot speak for all the people on the team um, <clears throat> or, or the other co-founders. Uh, there are two other co-founders, uh, along with myself, um, Brian Hoffman, the CEO of the company, and Washington Sanchez. Um, who was, uh, was a, a PhD cancer researcher in Australia before he joined uh, and co-founded the company with us. Um, but I will say this. There's a mix on, on the team of which sort of value proposition of the software that they find most compelling. Mm. I personally find what you described to be by far the most compelling part of it, which is I see Open Bazaar as... Uh, joining this long or, or extending this long chain of technological progress toward empowerment of the individual, which I think is what you're describing. Yes, that, that is absolutely why I'm most excited about it. But others on the team, I think, see the fact that uh, I think they see the existing commerce system that always has the middleman inserted as not being as efficient as it could. I mean, you don't always need the middleman involved in a trade, right? There are downsides to doing that. Now, there are certainly upsides, which is why people are doing it. I'm not, not saying that Amazon and eBay aren't valuable services to many people. They obviously are. Uh, but not in all cases. And right. also, you're forced to basically use the entire bundle of services from them that they offer for their cut, right? You don't have a choice to say, well, actually, I don't really care about dispute resolution. So can you take 8% off instead of 10, right? Like they, they don't do that. You have to take, it's all or nothing. Um, right. So I think there are some people on our team who feel like the idea of a zero take marketplace, the idea of creating this protocol, this sort of neutral techn technological protocol for trade is something that's necessary on the internet and doesn't exist yet. And so that's what they're excited about. So it's definitely a mix. Um, I mean, I see the value in both, but I view this as a liberating technology, and, and that's what excites me. Now, earlier you, you mentioned that you see this as something that could maybe uh, <clears throat> threaten people that, that currently have power. Yeah. Um, if we were to see a mass adoption of Bitcoin and mass adoption of Open Bazaar, and I, when I mean mass adoption, I mean you know hundreds of millions of people using the software, um, then there's no question this would that would that would threaten existing, uh, you know, power dynamics. Uh, but actually, I, I don't, I don't view the success of what we're doing and, and Bitcoin even as sort of this all or nothing, like you have to get 
a certain number of people in society using it and threatening the existing power structures for mm. it to be successful because mm. what I think I've sort of seen past uh, almost five years that I've been involved with, with Bitcoin, uh, late 2012 is when I sort of got started, uh, is a lot of people strongly prefer the convenience of the status quo over the uh, privacy and sort of security and liberty benefits of the new decentralized systems. So right. there's trade-offs involved, right? If you're doing something in a decentralized way, uh, there's no final authority on what's happening. You can't go to someone and say, uh, help me out here. You know, um, if you accidentally delete your Bitcoin keys or something, right? Like right. that they're gone. Like no one else is going to get you. There's no one there to back up what you've done other than yourself. Um, if someone tries to sort of like scam you or something, there's really no central authority like there is with maybe PayPal or a credit card company to get your money back. Um, uh, same with Amazon and, and that sort of thing. Like, so people, it's convenient to do, to use the status quo systems. They're right. set up for convenience. And a lot of people make the choice to prioritize convenience over things like privacy, security, and, and sort of liberty. Um, and I don't, I don't begrudge them or anything, but I recognize that it's always going to be a, a subset of the general population that cares about this stuff from an ideological perspective enough that they're actually going to take the effort to, to basically switch and use these new systems. Yes, I think a great analogy to what you're talking about is Uber, because there are some people who might use Uber explicitly to smash the taxi cartels for whatever right. reason, because they don't, they don't like the taxi cartels. Maybe they have a bad experience. They just don't like the principle of this kind of monopoly, let's say, in New York City. But you don't need all Uber. I mean, the vast majority of Uber users are not anti-taxi cartel ideologues. They're people who use it for the convenience sake. So you have kind of the convenience in the other direction where if the technology can be so advanced as to offer a more convenient alternative than the established system, it's probably going to pick up lots of people who are, who are kind of accidentally and indirectly contributing to this change in the power dynamic. Because with Uber, you have, let's say, uh, rider and um, driver empowerment, right? They're, they're, right? Taxi cartels have a bunch of regulations about what kind of cars you can drive, about how, you, how much you can pay, how much you can charge. Uber says, well, no, you actually have a little more, you have a little more free, uh, freedom than that. So even if you're somebody that loves taxi cartels, but you just prefer the convenience of Uber, you're still contributing to a changing power dynamic. And I think that's going to be the same thing with Bitcoin in, in particular. And I could see it with Open Bazaar too. If that's just the place that everybody goes, then I have to be a, some, some passionate libertarian ideologue. Just use it because it's simple. And, and I think long term, that, that's certainly my hope for what Bitcoin and Open Bazaar do, is that it's a better choice for all kinds of reasons than the existing systems. But I think right now, um, uh, it's not. I mean, on Open Bazaar, we're trying to make that true. Um, the first version of the software was released just over a year ago now, um, and there's a decent number of people using it all over the world. Like, we're we're pretty happy with with how many people have adopted it and are buying and selling stuff uh, using Bitcoin. It, it uses Bitcoin for um, for settlement of payments, um, but it's certainly nowhere near you know mass adoption. Now, the first take the first bill that we had is really going toward those ideological people, those people that cared about things we care about. But the 2.0 version of the software, which we are now uh, almost uh, finished with, probably coming out in August or September, um, is really built a lot more for people that uh, wanted to, you know, get the benefits of decentralized trade, the lower fees and whatnot without having to care about sort of the ideological thing. It's going to be a lot easier to use, mm -hmm. basically. And I wish I could say the same about Bitcoin right now. I mean, <laughs> to some extent, um, wallets and, and things on ramps into Bitcoin have gotten better, but the core technology itself um, has in some ways uh, gotten worse. Right. Because, um, uh, 
I don't know if we want to go into that here, but basically Bitcoin fees have gotten very high and uh, the transaction capacity in the network is, is uh, sort of artificially limited. So um, I don't know if Bitcoin's going to be the blockchain long term that sees mass adoption uh, because it may not be the one right now that's designed to handle mass adoption. Right. So talking about the convenience of Bitcoin, I actually had the same beliefs that, oh, it's too inconvenient, people won't use it. Prior to really diving into uh, you know, how to secure your Bitcoin keys and learning about how the whole system works. But after I learned about it, I actually came to the opposite conclusion that Bitcoin is so much easier. It's so much more convenient that the, the current system, the, the, the banking system, the credit card system is archaic in comparison. You, know, you can't do the banking stuff over the weekend and it takes three days yeah. for your stuff to transfer. And like they, they take a $20 wire transfer fee to go to the other bank account and it's all regulated and then it can be flagged. <laughs> it's like, it's laughably, <laughs> laughably archaic when with the Bitcoin system, once you, once you know how to use it, it's literally just pull out your phone, scan a little QR code, hit in the amount you want to send, hit it and go. You know, and, it's, and it used yeah, to be no, instant and practically yeah. free. I, I totally hear you, and there's there's certainly a lot of truth to that. Um, I will say, of course, that that's assuming that's before the current congestion of the network. Right. Um, so we're assuming that that's going to get solved, and I do have hopes that it will be. Um, but also, sometimes the the ease um, of using Bitcoin uh, is is partially because the existing systems are so heavily regulated and they have so many rules in place on how they can accept money mm. that the co those companies are forced to jump through all those hoops with the old system. And what I'm not certain of is long-term, will companies that are accepting Bitcoin uh, Will those companies be forced or, or attempted to be forced to jump through the same hoops for mm. their users? So the reason that it's so convenient to pull out your phone and scan a you know, QR code is that a lot of times they aren't forcing you to fill out your name and your address and your phone number, right? Like you have to do with a credit card, which is a huge pain in the behind. Right. Uh, however, in the future, you know, will governments attempt to force people who accept Bitcoin to go through the same hoops that credit card users have to mm. do? I don't know the answer to that. I will say that technology like Open Bazaar allows people to still choose to use Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general in the most raw, original form without people having to jump through the hoops uh, because it gives them complete control over their own trade. They can choose which uh, sort of you know rules that they choose to follow and, and which they don't. And that's, that's why we wanted to put out a platform that keeps the original value proposition of Bitcoin being this peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash uh, in its most useful form. Like you have this peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash, you want to use it with someone else in a completely decentralized way, here's the platform to do it. That's a great uh, that's point. A uh, and it makes me think of something like email, you know, right now, the email protocol, fortunately, isn't like super highly regulated, where you have to fill out your name and your address and billing address, whatever, every time you send an email, how unbelievably uh, silly that would be. And like, people would get mad if they had to, rather than just type in the message, hit, hit the email address and hit go, if you had to fill out all this stuff. But you're right, the cause of that is because of the regulations, because the government wants to keep track of, um, all kinds of data about what you're spending money on, uh, making sure that you pay the appropriate taxes and whatnot. But interestingly enough, if such a thing does happen in the Bitcoin space where merchants are required to get more information from their customers, that's definitely going to benefit you guys because that increases then the value proposition of Open Bazaar. So the, le the less efficient the current system is, the more you guys are going to benefit from it. Well, and the interesting aspect about that too is that there's there's the level of optionality as to how how much vendors and buyers choose to sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, follow the rules as they're set mm. or not. Right. So it's not like if you use a bazaar that you're forced to break any right. rules or forced to right. It's it everyone can use it exactly like they use any other platform out there right now. Right. Uh, but they can also use it in ways that get around all of the regulatory garbage 
that is, you know, not helping either buyer or seller. Uh, so it's really up to them to use it however they see fit. I mean, we intentionally built the protocol such that it is completely agnostic as to the type of trade that's happening. Because we get that question all the time from people, so right. what about drugs or whatever? And we just say, look, we built this neutral technology. It's a neutral protocol and platform. People are going to use it how they see fit. And we're comfortable with that. And, and, and people say, well, you know, uh, what, what about these illicit things happening? And, and in my mind, that's kind of like asking the people that made, that built the internet, like TCP IP, right. or that built the SMTP protocol for email or the SMS protocol for text messages. Like, well, why didn't you build safeguards into them to prevent people from abusing those? Because for something to really truly work, you have to try to build it in this neutral way that it can be used however people choose to use it. So I don't have an issue with that. If people choose to use it in a way that is, you know, immoral, that that uh, that is upsetting. I don't want that to happen. Uh, but for the technology to be useful to everyone, it has to also be useful for people that using it for stuff that I disagree with. It's a great point. And, you know, if we're going to be logically consistent and we if we were going to levy that attack on Open Bazaar on Bitcoin, we would have to levy it at all uh, platforms of uh, the right. exchange of value and the exchange of goods. So somebody could say, well, you want to use U.S. dollars. Well, what if somebody used that, uses that currency for a, a drug trade? Like, well, yeah. or that literal d bill that's in your wallet has probably been used for a drug trade. That's probably, yeah, that's probably true. So you go, is that a criticism of the means of exchange that people are, you know, illegally exchanging things? No. Same with Craigslist. Are there stolen goods that's on right. Craigslist? Yes, there are stolen goods on Craigslist. Is that a good thing? No, that's a shame. But you don't criticize the platform of Craigslist because some people are using it in a way that you don't approve of or that might be immoral or illegal. That's right. And there are some use cases that, you know, I honestly believe even if they are illegal, still need a, a, an outlet because the ramifications of governments attempting to prohibit them is much more harmful than just allowing their sale to begin with. I mean, yeah. The most obvious one is the drug trade, uh, the drug war. Uh, you know, the drug war is a failure in any conceivable way, based on any metric. Uh, incredibly harmful to you know humanity, broadly speaking. And you know, if uh, technologies that are decentralized allow people to get around that prohibition in a way that make you know genuinely benefits society, like like less people are physically harmed in the world because of it. Great. Um, and, and even even things that people think don't think much about, like uh, for example, uh, the counterfeit trade. Uh, there's a huge demand all over the world for people to buy fake Louis Vuitton bags, <laughs> right? And 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 you know people say, oh well, that's that's fake. Well, yeah, I mean it's a status thing, right? Like the Louis Vuitton bag is expensive because it's a status symbol, not because right. any particular inherent value in the Louis Vuitton bag, right? Um, well, people want that status symbol without paying that much money. <laughs> I haven't heard of this one. That's funny. Right? So so there's this market. I mean, it's a massive market all over the world. And this is one example of the counterfeits all over the place where people know they're buying counterfeits and mm. want to buy counterfeits. Mm. But platforms don't allow it. Mm. Um, and I don't, I mean, I personally, I don't have an issue with that. If people want to be able to buy counterfeits and they know what they're buying, uh, and someone makes them, I, you know, I, I just don't see why that sort of thing should be prohibited. So there's all kinds of categories of trade like that, that companies and governments around the world are restricting, and I think are doing more harm than good. Yes, and that, that you're getting at a principle here, which comes up all the time in economics and politics and the relationship between economics and politics, which is when you break down what is required in order for exchange to happen, it has to be the case that both parties think they're going to benefit from the exchange. There's a two-way value creation when exchange happens. Right. It doesn't really matter the, 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 the concretes of the exchanges. The fact that the exchange happens demonstrates something about the expected value of both the participants engaging in it. Now, that's, that's one of the counterintuitive examples, something like counterfeits, where if you break it down, it's like, okay, well, it's actually not harming anybody. This is something that is is 
creating lots of value for the producer and for the consumer of the good. And there's countless examples like that that nobody's even conceived of, I'm sure, of value that's going to be created by people being able to exchange in places that they weren't able to exchange. And then there's immediate um, uh, political benefits. If we just, let's say, let, we'll go outside of the United States, because that's where you and I both are, but we're talking about China, for example. China restricts trade all the time, like you said, about what kind of media you can consume. Yeah. There's the Great Firewall of China, which online, they regulate what types of things, well, they try to at least, regulate right. what types of uh, information can flow into your head. They can also do this through the sale of books. So this is an opportunity to get around, yeah, to, you'd say it explicitly, to get around those types of regulations, which I think are immoral. Yeah, technically, it might be the case that smuggling in literature that the Communist Party doesn't like in China is illegal. Yes, that that might be the case. But that doesn't mean it's a bad thing if you do it. Of course, yeah. Illegality and immorality are, are not the same thing. Sometimes right. they are, um, but often they aren't. And uh, whatever technology can be used for people who are doing things that are illegal but moral right uh i'm i'm supportive of uh i mean personally i'm supportive certainly open bazaar wasn't specifically designed in order for people to get around any laws as i said it's a completely neutral protocol right uh and naturally you know as a co-founder of my company obligated to say that ob1 <laughs> is not trying to build uh, this in order for people to get around the law at all. I mean, the services we're going to provide to OpenBazaar users are all uh, obviously completely above board. Right. But but personally, because I care about liberty and freedom, uh, I want people to be empowered to use these tools to, to make their lives better. Right. Yeah, I think that's the word for it, is neutral. I mean, it's, it is a neutral technology, and that means it's going to be used for things you approve of and things that you don't approve of. And I think that's part of the, that is part of the, the beauty and the toleration that comes with freedom is you're free to do things that I don't necessarily approve of, but as long as your actions aren't hurting, hurting other people, you should be free to do those actions and engage in those trades. So I think this is where I want to wrap up the conversation. If people want to know more about Open Bazaar, what, where can they learn about the technology? Where can they download the technology? So if they want to use it, um, openbazaar.org is the website to download. Uh, users should be aware that in a few months, we're going to be putting out the 2.0 version of the software, which makes uh, significant improvements. Um, and also, there's a blog. If you go to openbazaar.org, you'll see the link to the blog. We regularly update the community on what's happening. We also talk about uh, things that are sort of outside of just Open Bazaar about Bitcoin broadly and all kinds of information. Um, and uh, you can search for me on Twitter and all the usual social media places as well. All right. I'll put uh, those links in the show notes page, steve-patterson.com slash 62. Thanks so much, Sam. This has been an awesome conversation. All right. Thanks, Steve. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed my conversation with my brother, Sam. We've been talking about this technology just privately between us for years. We both have very similar political beliefs. We've both written books about Bitcoin, and now he's gone on to co-found a company in the crypto world. I'm very proud of him, and if you'd like to learn more, head over to the show notes page this week, and make sure to tune in for the next month, as I've got a series of really spectacular interviews coming down the pipeline. All right, that's all for me today. Have a great week.